Today, in the driver's seat, we have clean tech entrepreneur, energy expert, and master of the Sankey diagram, Saul Griffith. Hello. How you doing, Saul? Good. That's good. Um, I've mentioned to a few people over the last couple of weeks that I was going to take you for a drive, and everyone I've spoken to said that you and I are going to get along very well today. So um, far, so good. So far, so good. Um, you've done some pretty amazing things in your career, and you've written a couple of books, um, and you've just got a new book out now called The Big Switch. Yep. Which is about how... Wait a second, I actually queued something for that. We didn't bring the book. Oh, but yeah. I bought a photo of the book on the cell phone. There it is. So there it is, The Big Switch. The big Switch, nice. Black Ink Books, launches on Valentine's Day. It's my love letter to planet Earth. Yep, absolutely. So we're going to chat about that today. Um, but before, before we do, I'm just going to ask you a quick favor. Um, see that little button there with the car diagram? That one, yep. And see that one there that says glove box? If you just push that. Ah, he lied to me. He lied to me. This is the first there it one. is. This is the first one I've seen. The publisher told me I'd have 40 already, but I don't have any, so... Well, it was a bit of a logistical effort to, to get it done, but, um, but we've got one. That's incredible. Now, I also know that you've conspired with people to keep the secret from me. Uh, yeah, well, when you asked me earlier, I, I, I really don't like lying, but I, I had to in... in um, yeah, just to, to, to keep it a surprise. But, so, um, so it's the second like book I've written, and the first time I was writing a book, I would say in front of my wife, my wife, because I found writing a book the first time hard, was like, I'm like, this is like giving birth out of my fingertips. Yeah. And she's like, you have no fucking idea what giving birth <laughs> is like. How <laughs> dare you say that? Anyway, you, which is to say, you get kind of attached to the book you write, so when you see it... In, in the flesh. In the flesh, yeah. it's, it's pretty great. Yeah. Well, I actually only got this copy yesterday, but I've read your, I've read the digital copy over the last week, and I've got to say it's one of the best things I've ever read. Um, I think that, well, I, I just want to say that every politician in Australia needs to read this book, and every journalist in Australia needs to read this book. And just a message to um, Australian Twitter, please read this book, tell your friends to read the book and then tell your friends to tell their friends to read the book as well because um, this is a blueprint this is an instruction manual for how we as a nation decarbonize our society um, it's how we, we we act on climate but also how we dramatically improve our standard of living in this country as well so i want to thank you for for writing the book saul um, well, I believe all those things, um, and I believe you've actually read it, so if that's what you believe after reading it, then uh, doubly thank you. Um, and that is my hope. Like, uh, I've been working on renewables, clean energy for 25 years. I study international energy systems. These are the Sankey diagrams that I'm somewhat famous for. This is the reason we're driving an electric car today, not a hydrogen car. Yeah. <laughs> so go to page 59 to see why it's all about electricity. Yeah. Um, and I actually want to go one step further than what Dan said. Like the real, I wrote a book two years ago called Electrify that was focused on America and how to decarbonate, you know, why America should lead on and go big and go hard on climate and what it would look like just because American politics is in a dark place, they're not going to, you know, go to war like World War II on climate in quite the way we thought. Mm -hmm. And um, I think if you're then looking for the next best story to get the world to go faster, this is it. Yep. And what I really... Structurally, Australia has such advantages in an all-electric clean energy economy. Um, we get to reap the savings first. We will save money as a nation. Um and actually, this is so weird to say, after 20 years of abhorrent federal climate policy in this country, but um, Australia literally has the opportunity in the next few years to show the world how it's done and yeah. bring the whole world 10 years forward. Absolutely. So Absolutely. Um, I, th I think that... Go and read it for that reason. Definitely. <laughs> definitely. And I think that um, in Australia, the, the renewable energy revolution has been suppressed for 20 years. But um, 
like it's like pushing a, a a beach ball, trying to push a beach ball underwater. At some point, it's gonna it's gonna pop up, and I think that moment is about to happen now. And I think once that tipping point is reached, um, and people get on board with this, you know, there's such a massive opportunity for for this country to to lead, as you say in your book. Yeah, and you know, in spite of all of the pushing down of the beach ball that's been happening here, <laughs> Australia did one thing right, which is why I, I, I think it's really critical to this story. Like, we we don't tolerate bureaucracy very well, so we eliminated the red tape and the green tape from installing rooftop solar. We had the government did the right thing; they embraced this new industry. They subsidised it a little bit in the early days, which is necessary to develop a new market, and now. Rooftop solar in Australia is the cheapest electricity anywhere in the world. Yeah, I've heard we have the biggest uptake of rooftop solar in the world now. Is that, is that right? I'm sure there's it's an island there. nation somewhere that may be higher. Yeah, but like, right. Of large countries that, that are really impactful in the climate sense, Australia is crushing it. Yeah. More than, more, and so what that means is more than a third of Australian households have had a positive experience in the future, which the electric future, because they've got cheaper bills because of solar. Yeah, wow. And, you know, if you were driving this car, which... Can we stop chatting and drive it? Yep. Uh, uh, you know, if you're charging this off rooftop solar in Australia, this is like going to be two or three cents a kilometre to drive. Yeah, it's it's phenomenal. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I'm keen to get into the drive, but just a couple more things there. That, that um, a couple months ago, I saw a post on Twitter from a guy in Norway who um, said that the spot price of electricity, because of a, a, a huge amount of wind energy coming off the North Sea, he said the spot price of electricity in Norway was like something like 0.1 cents per kilowatt hour and that he had just fully charged his Model 3 Tesla for 10 cents. And obviously you know, that's in, not always going to be like that, but that's in, where we're heading. Huh? In California now, typically at 1 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the spot price of electricity is negative. Yeah, wow. Right, so this is what people also don't get. Like we've, we've, we've thought about that the way to save the world was through scarcity, mm. but probably it's going to be about abundance. Like let's overbuild our solar and our wind capacity so that it's that dirt cheap. Yeah, exactly. And and the action on climate in Australia over the last 20 years has been framed as a burden, you know, that, that we're going to have to give up things. But really, it's the it's the opposite. You know, <laughs> we're going to have an abundance of, of energy and um, it's my, incredibly my, exciting. My, my only disappointment is we're not towing an electric jet ski today. <laughs> yeah, or a caravan. <laughs> or a caravan. <laughs> I actually put a deposit on an electric jet ski this week. Yeah, wow. Uh, there's a Canadian company that's making them um, and I think that's going to be awesome. But like, you know, turns out in the future we might have pretty awesome electric jet skis and electric barbecues and electric trucks to... Electric leaf flowers? Oh, that can't happen too soon. <laughs> that, that's got to happen way sooner. Nice. All right. Well, let's get out there. One more thing before we go. Um, on coal miners in Teslas, we we don't mind a bit of swearing, and there's a bit of swearing on the front cover. So would you and it, would you mind reading out the endorsement from Mike Cannon Brooks for us as well? I don't know how to do Mike's accent, and even with my unruly beard and bad hair, I think he can <laughs> he can out unruly me. <laughs> anyway, in Mike's accent. About fucking time we have an actual plan written down that can be executed and financed. In a decarbonized world, Australia is a winner. The opportunity is ours for the taking. Nice. Absolutely it is. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> awesome. All right, let's, let's, you want me to take that back from you so you can drive? Yeah, I blame my mother. I think she was a original rail burning, whale saving okay. feminist environmentalist. Um, and so, uh, some of that you know honestly because we live you know I grew up in a beautiful country and and the critters in the, the bush is magnificent and worth saving so I think that was that's all good embedded into me yeah right um, that you know all of our holidays were camping all over Australia and, you know usually driven by my mother like let's go and find a you know particular species of the lesser beetle and then we'd spend a week in a hide trying to find it and so we I, you know i got to see as a kid um enabled by my father who he enjoyed like outfitting the old cars we had with all the camping gear and oh, yeah. have these amazing experiences so i grew up loving australia loving the environment and then uh 
was aware early of climate change and what was wrong. So yeah, um, that defined my life for a few years. So. Yeah, I kind of had a similar path where I had I developed a real love of nature, and then in I think it was two thousand five, I read Tim Flannery's book, The Weathermakers. And that really changed my life, understanding how serious and urgent the climate crisis was. You know what we should have done today? We should have gone around the corner and picked up Tim. Oh, yeah. He well, lives about uh, two blocks from here. Oh, really? Yeah, so... Uh, well, he's like a hero of mine, so maybe he'll come back another time and... Uh, I'm sure Tim would love to um, would love to do your show. He's a great guy. Yeah. And... Um, you really just every time you get past now you know you want to do it well you've still got another te- if you want to uh, show that if you want to show this guy uh, what you know that electric vehicles are dominant you're more than welcome to uh, I know I'm just I could, I could be so bad though look it's totally up to you <laughs> oh my god it's insane it also from 100 to 200 is yeah. pretty amazing <laughs> I personally never miss an opportunity to show someone in a high performance car that electric vehicles are totally dominant. You'd never miss. I never miss an opportunity. How many points do you have left on your license? Uh, I've been pretty lucky so far, but let's say I, I look, look. Let's say I have a lot of fun under the speed limit. Um, we, we don't condone going over the, the speed limit. Sometimes you accidentally overshoot a little bit. I think but, it was amazing. We, that guy was doing 110, and we passed him doing 111. It was yeah, that was amazing. Yeah. Passed him very quickly at 111. Yeah. Um, but but I I um, never miss an opportunity at the traffic lights. Say you know even around the city where it's 60 k's an hour speed limit, you know, getting zero to 60, you're not breaking the law. But you know I I, I think of it as activism, right? When you're at a when, when you're when you're at a set of lights, when you're at a set of lights, and there there might be like 10, 20 people all looking at that intersection and you floor it across the intersection and you're you're 50 meters down the road by the time that the person next to you their front wheels has just got across the line and you're 50 meters down the road so you you introduced me to a new term earlier today called petro masculinity yeah and actually what we really need it's like you are the poster child of electro masculinity basically <laughs> basically um, yeah i love it electro masculinity is is like not that stale old toxic petro masculinity. Electro masculinity is for the refined Australian man. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It just happens to be able to pass anyone he wants on the freeway. Yeah. Well, listening to classical music. Cue. Uh, uh, Cue <laughs> <Q> Beethoven. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, the, the other day I was thinking, you know, I, I do, I try, I, I never miss an opportunity at the lights, especially if I'm next to a BMW or a Mercedes or whatever. And I thought, you know, I'm probably averaging, you know, I drive to work, I drive home, probably average like five times a day flooring it at lights. And I've had the car for two years. So let's say 200 days a year, I'm, I'm getting five, five uh, accelerations a day at traffic lights. That's a thousand times a year. And let's say that like five or 10 people at the lights might see me shoot off. So, you know, you're talking like five, 10,000 people. Let's... That's activism. It's more, more followers than I have on Twitter. Yeah, there you and go. You're, you're really doing it. Real uh, world. What I find amazing about the story, because I've owned a bunch of fast cars that I built myself running on petrol, and if you try to accelerate that fast that many times in a petrol car, you're like, you're rebuilding parts. Yeah, and you, you're pissing everyone off with the loud noise and the toxic shit that's coming out the exhaust pipe. Yeah, so this thing will just keep doing it over and over yeah. and over again. How's your endorphins at the moment? Well, uh, they dropped or dropped a little. Although I did, I did get a little back when little I went 111 <laughs> kilometres to pass the uh, the guy in the muscle car. Yeah, um, that was that was nice. Well, whenever you need another injection, just feel free. Rewiring America. Tell us about that. What, what, what the goal of that that was? At that point, 2006, you kind of had to justify why it was necessary to take such incredible technological risk in order to fix climate change, yes. and so. I became really into energy data in the US and around the world because at the end of the day, the climate problem is actually in it, is nearly all an energy problem. Yep. And so how you reform the energy system and how all of that energy flows around was really important. So I got really good at going through all the data. So I've read thousands and thousands of pages of boring government documents and then turned that into storytelling to support building these energy businesses mm-hmm. that are building. Um, but also sort of started doing a lot of public speaking around climate energy 
and um, I lost track of where we were in the conversation. But that's that ultimately led to rewiring, rewiring America because. You know, the real moment was watching the presidential candidates in 2019 all go up on stage. It was the, the primary, so this is when the Democrats were trying to figure out who'd run for president for them. So yeah. it was Buttigieg Bernie. and Bernie Sanders yeah. and Elizabeth Warren and Biden and the whole lot. And they were doing such an astonishingly bad job at selling why it was important to fix climate yeah. or even that it might be okay they were still very the traditional narrative of like oh, solving climate change is kind of going to suck and it's yeah. going to be hard yeah. and so we're like you know what the world needs is a really strong voice saying no we know we're the pathway we can do it we can fix climate change and it's pretty simple you've got to electrify just about everything yeah. and then um, we actually worked with a whole bunch of those campaigns and some of our messaging started to improve the, you know, their talking points later in the campaign a little bit and then um, we decided we should just launch an organisation and try and do it. We weren't particularly partisan. Um, we reached out to Trump's team and to a bunch of Republicans as well yep. where there was some corners of the Republican Party that were totally interested in talking to us about um, what rewiring America would mean. Mm -hmm. um, that wasn't the Trump part. Yep. <laughs> Just to be really honest. So you're basically impartial and you're reaching out to any any kind of political leaders that, like, that you could, yeah. It's like, honestly, people, can't you see that this could all work out really nicely? Yeah. Um, why, why are you bickering? Um, it may be a terrible thing to say, but I'm like, you know, if we could solve climate change, we can bicker about abortion for another thousand years. Yeah. <laughs> but if we don't fix climate change, right? It's, there's nothing to bicker about. There's nothing to bicker about. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of incredible stats and data in your book, but there's also a bit of a narrative there as well. But I, I really love the, um, the geeky stuff. I studied mechanical engineering, and my favorite subject at uni was thermodynamics. Ah, right? I, I knew I loved you. That's why, yeah, yeah. That's why they knew. <laughs> that's, why, that, that's why they knew we'd get along, because um, your book talks a lot about um, the efficiency difference between internal combustion engines and uh, electric electric motors and really this is something that I've really been banging on a lot about over the last few years as well and um, so let's talk about electric battery electric uh, electric vehicles compared to internal combustion engine cars and the amount of wastage um, so so we could totally make ourselves seasick on this road right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm fine with it. I'm used to it. But if you're, it, yeah, you, you've got the you've got the endorphin button. So yeah, yeah. it's um, <laughs> it is a crazy windy road. So yeah, yeah. This is awesome. Does it have traction? It has traction control. Yeah, yeah. I, I've never spun the wheels on it. So oh wow. And so. the brakes are phenomenal. You can also swear as well, like that's that's what this channel's about, so... My mother, I love my mother, um, I've been swearing a lot in Australia, like, I, in the US I started to be well behaved and like, I guess I'd had enough media training that I had learned to curb the swearing, mm -hmm. um, but you know, you come back to Australia, you start, you know... Well, it's part of the vocabulary, you Part so. of the vocabulary, and so I've led more than, more than the average fuck or shit or damn or... Etc. out in um, my various uh, writing and public speaking. Yeah. Here. And then, but my mother lives here. Oh, uh, okay. Like, Saul, you'll never, people will never believe you about this climate change stuff if you have such bad language. <laughs> so this is the Royal National Park. Speaking of things worth saving, yep. second oldest national park in the world. Wow. Missed out by a year to Yellowstone in the US. Wow, really? So, one, you know, in like Australia does know how to do protect the environment well. We were like super early leaders in it. And I think per capita, we've got the most national park in the world. Yeah. Um, we got a lot. To we've got a lot to love here, right? And you know that everyone enjoys it. Everyone's out there in their trucks every weekend enjoying our parks yeah. and stuff. Yeah. It's worth saving, to, which brings us back to thermodynamics. Nice. I am very keen to talk about thermodynamics, but I'm also keen to let you just enjoy this little I mean, section. So. We're in a particularly spectacular 
piece of subtropical rainforest yeah. um, on the southern end of the Royal National Park. Let's enjoy this, and when we get back onto the main road, we can we can geek out a bit more. Yeah. This is the road where, if you're an auto maker, this is the road you have the car drive on with the sun coming down through the trees, the perfect dappled light, the leaves that sort of pop up after you go around the corner in your enormously fast electric vehicle. Are you saying this is one of the best best roads in the country possibly to, to drive a car? It's got to be up there. I mean, Ocean there. Road, Great Ocean Road, obviously. Um, but like, this piece of road here is spectacular and as soon as we get through this little bit of rainforest we're going to drop down from Stanwell Park down to the down to the ocean nice. um, and we'll go across that famous uh, bridge that's cantilevered all the way out of the ocean like I'm, I'm sure now everyone who's bought a car in Australia bought a car because it was photographed yeah, in one right. of these two places iconic <laughs> yeah. there's a thing in thermodynamics called the Carno cycle or Carno, Carno cycle engines you probably know a bit more about this than I do, and I've, I've probably forgotten a bit since I studied it at, at university. But basically, any internal combustion engine vehicle has a limit on its efficiency. So I think, and, and again, pr correct me if I'm wrong, but it's around 25% um, is the maximum efficiency you can get out of a internal combustion engine. Oh, you can get up to 60% and maybe more if you also recover the heat. But typically you can only do that in a really big engine. Right, um, but for your typical car, like a small yeah. car. Anyway, in the, the cartoon version of thermodynamics for this issue yep. is um, the efficiency of any motor that is a heat engine that burns something is limited by the difference between the, the, the hot temperature and the cold temperature. Yep. Cold temperature is determined by the Air that's coming in, the hot temperature is how you can high, how hot you can run your motor. Mm -hmm. Little motors like these, you can't run them too hot without seizing everything up. Not like this one. This is a car that doesn't have that stupidity in it. Yeah. Um, An internal anyway. combustion engine car of this size, kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Any any car that we drive on the roads, honestly, the the motors might be as much as thirty percent efficient now. They've got better in the last few decades. Yeah. But once you go through the gearbox and the transmission, each one of these things, you you, you lose. You go through the diff, you lose a few percent more so you've you've already lost 70 percent of the energy in the petrol yep then you lose a few a few percent more going through the transmission a few percent more going through the diff a few percent more going through the trans axle axles even a, even a little bit in the flexibility of the tires yep and at the end of the day any car that's running on petrol or diesel you're you're really pushing it to get 20 percent of that energy yeah, wow. in the fuel to push you forward wow that is phenomenal so Basically, if you've got for, for every liter of petrol that you burn, only 200 mils is actually going into moving the car. The rest is getting kind of pissed away in heat and noise. Is that heat and noise, mostly heat, a um, little bit of noise, um, and yeah, that's that's you know that's why people who own Land Rovers used to put a stew pot in the engine bay. Yeah, um, very very typical uh, South African thing to do you'd, you'd put a cast iron pot on the engine yeah. dry for 8 hours and then you'd have a perfect stew when you used to be an ready. ad of someone cooking an egg on it or something as well I'm sure yeah. Um, yeah but that's all that's all waste heat and it's not it doesn't just plague our cars right it plagues our coal generators that make our electricity natural gas our coal, so coal, our coal generators are 20 25 30 percent efficient too they're terrible yep. natural gas is maybe 30 or 40 percent um, sometimes as high as 50 or 60 again if they do heat recovery so they use some energy as electricity some as heat but it, the you know the again the headline of the book I wrote in America the book I wrote in Australia is if we electrified nearly everything we do we don't lose all of that heat and in fact the country only need needs less than half of the energy we think we need yeah that is extraordinary and yeah. this, this is one of the big things the big takeouts of of the book is that um, we need far less energy than we think we do and would you say that whenever whenever you oh, hear it really pulls <laughs> nicely out of the corners oh yeah <laughs> sorry no no it's good oh, and because it because the battery packs down in the floor that's why it handles so well around the corners it keeps it very like the vehicle dynamics in this thing are excellent so. 
it's um, I've driven the S. This is a lot better. It's more agile. Yeah, I love it. I have to admit, I keep, I keep engaging the wrong things. Can you do the the, the levers for me? <laughs> Switch I'll them. do the I'll do the fun one and the, yeah. the steery one. You can do the rest. All right. <sighs> you push the the um, endorphin button and I'll. Uh... <laughs> I don't even need the endorphin today. It's yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, so, so whenever whenever we're told we need to replace um, X amount of energy, that, that's actually not not true, is it? We we, we don't need to we, we don't need to get to hundred percent renewable to replace all the the embedded energy in the in the system. Is that is that a fair point? Or? Yeah. And um, there's been a lot of fairly disingenuous. Or bullshit conversations about how we're going to transform our energy system, yep. and a lot of them start with, "Well, if we use and these these energy systems are talked about in units of um, quadrillion British thermal units in yeah. the US, which is the most absurd unit ever, and in Australia petajoules, but neither of these really are relatable." So I just like to think about like if we use a hundred units of energy today, think of it as percent. Everyone thinks, well, we're going to need 100 units tomorrow when we're renewable. Yep. But you know, the point was, if you electrify all the cars, you electrify all the heating systems, you electrify the water heaters, and you electrify the cooking, and we produce it all with solar and wind, you'll need 40 units to do the same stuff. You don't shrink the cars, you don't shrink the houses, you don't turn the... They still go just as fast, if not faster. They go faster. <laughs> they go... They go much, much faster. faster. Um, <laughs> let's try that. Oh, yeah, you can actually even break traction out at the yeah. pretty substantial um, corners that we have here. So yeah. You really do have to drive it for a while to be used to it. It is like owning your own spaceship, really. Yeah. Basically, when we're told we need to get to 100% renewables, we do, but we, we can, we'll actually get there a lot sooner. Or we, we can get... We can decarbonize our society much faster than we're led to believe as well, is the, is the other thing, really. It's a little bit easier than we think. The conversation nearly always in energy has been about the supply side. So the supply side is where do we get our energy? Where does the oil come from? Where do we get our coal? Where do we get our natural gas? And we very rarely talk about the demand side. Mm. The demand side is where we use energy. The demand side is when my foot demands that this car goes yes. really fucking <laughs> fast, which it does. Yes. Um, so that was the demand side viscerally felt in yeah. my gut and my, you know, my intestines are in the back seat um, demanding to come back. Um, but the demand side is, is where all the things happen. You have to electrify the demand side as well, right? Mm -hmm. So we've always talked about, oh, eliminating the coal plants or you know, transitioning off gas. But you've really also got to think about what happens on where we live, where our cars are, where our hot water heaters are, where our stovetops are. Mm -hmm. We've got to do that demand side. And it's actually when you start from that side of the energy equation and you think about the consequences of electrifying that you have the epiphany. It's like, oh my God, it's going to be great. Yeah. We have, electrification is the efficiency we we're always looking for, except it's not just efficiency, it's like higher performance, more fun. Yeah, and this this is really um, uh, shown really well in uh, some of your Sankey diagrams. You're showing the supply side versus the, the demand side like really, really clearly. Um, and and you're, you're right, like if, if, if we do focus on the demand side, then you get those massive efficiency uh, or those massive energy savings. You start to realize, well, we actually don't need as much uh, on the supply side as we as yeah, kind of thought. Yeah, and we did. I actually was looking at this yesterday, the, it's, but it's in the book, um, The Big Switch by Blackie mm -hmm. um, Publishing. But um, take the average Australian household. There's 2.6 people in it, and there's 1.7 cars in the driveway. Um, they drive on average 15,000 kilometers a year, both of those cars. Mm -hmm. um, they heat their home with a little bit of natural gas. You do the cooking with natural gas, it's very typical. Um, have air conditioning. The daily energy use of all of those activities so the petrol, the diesel, the natural gas, the propane around the barbecue, the whole thing is about 101 kilowatt hours per day for the whole household. Yep. And we pay about $5,000 a year in that household for the privilege of all of those fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. If you electrify that household, 
and you run it off renewables. Same again, same size household, 1.7 cars, same 2.6 people, more comfortable. Uh, it needs about 35 kilowatt hours. Wow. So, so that's the enormous. Third almost, yeah. It's a third. That's an enormous yeah. win. Um, and that that's half the reason that drives the incredible economics of this transition. Yeah, it's just incredible. And and we haven't even talked about the health benefits yet, like the gas. Let's talk about let's talk about gas stove tops for a, for a while because they don't get a mention much. But right, this is the next thing you're you're you've got to after you've finished converting everyone with your Tesla. I want you to take an induction barbecue to the masses. Yeah, I'd love to because this is the one that flies under the radar. Yeah, it's, you know? it's the next culture war. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's one of I'm just going to swing around and take a look at this view and the um, what have we got? A hang glider up there. Actually, let's go in here. This is uh, Stanwell Park. Um, Stanwell Tops on Stanwell Park. This is a very famous hang gliding spot. Um, it's actually where. Hargraves, famous Australian, was the first, um, he actually developed the wing profiles for the Wright brothers. Oh, wow. With experiments that he ran with um, kites that he flew here. Because it's oh, this an is amazingly amazing. windy place. Um, and these are wind powered. Uh, these are wind powered. Yeah. Um, you could, if you wanted to, you could turn those into 25 kilowatt wind turbines. Wow. Roughly, those hang gliders. That's fantastic. Um, it's a beautiful. I, I can watch them all day. Yeah. It's just so early. What a stunning spot. Anyway, Australians were really important um, through Hargraves, who ultimately was knighted, um, because he contributed to the development of human flight. Yeah. He did one experiment when he tried to try tow a. a a dinghy across Wollongong Harbour using one of his kites and the notes in the corner of the logbook was too dangerous don't try again <laughs> <laughs> kind of like driving this car this fast yeah wow um, so yeah the gas stoves thing it's really bad for our health isn't it um, globally leading cause of respiratory illness is cooking with fossil fuels yeah um, Nat, they, they call it. They like to call it natural gas, but really, it's fossil. It's fossil gas. Yeah, the global statistics are also because some people are cooking with charcoal in right in in Africa, for example. Um, but honestly, the the in, in the US, if you are trained as a doctor or a pediatrician, a doctor for children, if a child represents with um, respiratory illness, wheezing, asthma symptoms, the first question they will ask is, "Do you?" Really? Do you, do you, you cook your with, home with natural gas? Do you cook with gas? Wow. Because it's so um, obviously um, correlated with respiratory problems. And in fact, it's even known to affect the pets. Pets in the house are wow. die younger because they're it's, doing it. It's, 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 never, it's never talked about. Really. Never talked about. Uh, it's starting to be talked about um, more and more. And I think it will be, yet again, one of, you know, Everything you do to solve climate change at this point improves your health, improves the environment, yeah. improves your life. Yeah. And this is going to be, you know, this is the new story that we'll just keep hearing. There will still be the natural gas industry. In fact, I just spent 18 months beating my head trying to negotiate Build Back Better with the White House and the Biden presidency. Mm -hmm. And, you know, who was there fighting against that progress was... Dun, 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 the natural gas industry. Yeah, of course. Yeah, um, it's the same. It's the same here in Australia, yeah. where we, we, you know, Santos, one of Australia's largest uh, oil and gas companies, actually sponsored the pavilion at um, COP26 in in Glasgow. You know, I just love pulling through the apex of the corner with yeah. your foot jammed to the floor. <laughs> 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 so good. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty amazing. Um, you mentioned gas should be my next project and I was just thinking maybe I should start a YouTube channel called Coal Miners Cooking with Induction Stoves. I love it. Um, <laughs> how about uh, frackers with forks? Nice, <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, or, or something. Yeah, but we'll, we'll, we'll workshop that. We're, yeah, yeah. But I, I actually recently moved into a new apartment and it has an induction stove and it's the first time I've 
I've, I've used induction stove. It is awesome. Yeah. It's so good. They are so much better. So fast. So, they're, so you know, we talked about car no efficiency. It, it's not exactly the same, but something similar happens with your stove. When you're cooking with the gas flame, that pretty blue natural flame yeah um that we've been sold for 30 years in the world's most amazing pr campaign yeah cooking with gas cooking with it's like all of the metaphors yeah yeah um anyway those things that lie that we've been sold only about 30 percent of that gas heats your whatever you're cooking yeah wow um and with electric or induction um which is electric it's just a more focused version of it using magnets um 70 plus percent yeah wow. so it's you know, roughly twice as good yeah um at boiling water cooking your stuff um because it just focuses all the energy where you want it in the pot and yep. so now with induction it's faster some people will remember like that coil that their grandmother had that yeah it's unclear that you ever got to have that cup of tea she promised you yeah yeah that's <laughs> not electric cooking anymore electric cooking is just faster and more fun cleaner oh. easier it's so good. It's so good. I'm, I'm, I'm loving the induction stove. And now I'm just that annoying person to all my friends who is trying to get the, get them to call their landlords and demand that they get rid of that disgusting gas stove in their kitchen. Turns out the interesting thing about being the guy who writes the book on electrification is um, <laughs> it's like all of my friends think I'm the electric police. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. And so anytime I see anyone, I haven't seen them for a few months or even a few years, the first thing they're like is, just got an induction stove. Oh, nice. <laughs> I put in an order. I put in an order on the F-150 Lightning. Um, the Tesla is on its way. Yeah, like, yeah. I've, I'm successfully guilting them all into embracing the future. So, where, are we going to go back to Thermo? Uh, I can talk Thermo for days. I'm like to have someone trapped in a car with me who's <laughs> willing to listen to me talk about Sadie Carno and the consequences of the first, second, and third law. I'm all in. Yeah. Well, on so we talked about Carno and how like basically it's probably important to mention to people listening that the it's it's effectively a a, a, um, a physical limit or a physics limit that that that's stopping us from which you know you can put so many bells and whistles on a on a diesel or a petrol engine but you're not going to get much above you know 25 30 percent or whatever it is yeah um, we, we, we've been fighting that battle like you know for 100 years at least more, yeah. and um ever since the 1970s that's literally been the response of the nixon government to the energy crisis which was an oil supply crisis of 1973 was basically to try and improve the thermodynamics of cars and improve the thermodynamics of natural gas heaters. Yeah. But you, we've, we're at the end of that game. Like, you've got fraction, you know, man, many millions of dollars for a fraction of a percent improvements, yet if you just look at the raw energy in to useful workout, that game is over. Go to electric, and in every case, whether it's cooking, whether it's heating your water, whether it's heating your home, whether it's driving your electric vehicle like an absolute asshole as we have today, um, it's two or three times yeah. less energy to do it all electrically. Yeah, because like a battery electric uh, is, is running at what, 90, 95% efficiency in, in comparison? Electric uh, You know, to go from this top of the stack all the way through, when you, you don't generate waste heat, when you take 20% of the energy out of the sunlight, it just becomes electricity when you put that electricity into a battery you lose a couple of percent when yep. you pull it out of the battery you lose a couple of percent that's very different to losing 70% yeah I so mean, we're talking 95% efficiency 95% yeah. in and out of the battery and then uh, a really perfectly tuned electric motor you can get up to near, nearly 98% I think in these Teslas they're pretty astonishing 96 97s um, yeah even a Dirt cheap hand wound electric motor is eighty five percent efficient. Yeah. It's yeah. like we it's game over. The worst electric motor is double the efficiency of the best um, internal combustion engine, basically. Yeah, rough, yeah, yeah. roughly. Um, okay, so let's let's stay with that now, and let's talk about my favourite chapter, which is the chapter on hydrogen, because <laughs> I have spent the last like. 12, 18 months um, 
in furious debate with people on Twitter about the fraud that is the hydrogen economy. Um, oh, that's probably harsh words because there, there will be a role to play for. It's harsh hydrogen. words, and we've got to be careful. And, yeah, we've got to be careful. Um, first, I probably have to qualify myself to even have an opinion on hydrogen. Um, I, like I said, I've built a lot of technology companies. I've my lab in the US. We've done a, more than a dozen technology development projects with the US DOE, which is making new technology. One of those was developing natural gas tanks for vehicles because mm-hmm. there was a period 20 years ago where we did we weren't sure the batteries were going to be great so it was still maybe a good idea to use natural gas instead of oil because mm-hmm. you can make it more efficient natural gas car than you can petrol car so we made natural gas tanks and we made them and they were great and we licensed it off and that technology is being used in the world and then we decided to use those oh there's this hydrogen thing but this is a better way to make those tanks so i actually made the world's best hydrogen tanks mm-hmm. for cars and I intimately know hydrogen and how ter- utterly terrifying it is um, we also sold that technology so a consortium that includes Toyota, Porsche and Audi all the automotives actually own the technology we developed to mm-hmm. make hydrogen vehicles so I feel like I'm qualified to have an opinion on hydrogen if hydrogen does really well in the world I'm going to make a lot of money but I hope that it doesn't mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, because it's not a very good idea. Um, so Why is it not a good idea? Why is hydrogen not a good idea? So we've talked about the electrons that you get from your solar cell. If I take an electron from my solar cell, because the only good hydrogen is green hydrogen. Green hydrogen means I've made it with um, renewable electricity. Don't be fooled. Most of the hydrogen conversation in Australia is about blue and grey hydrogen. That's, mm-hmm. let's just say, straight up cynical bullshit yeah that's fossil hydrogen all of the world's hydrogen today is a byproduct of the natural gas um, refining process yeah and so everyone is using hydrogen today it's leftovers from making natural gas and they're they're calling Um, it they're also calling it clean hydrogen which which they also tried to do with coal clean coal clean hydrogen it's kind of the same yeah so that's you know whatever you can't have natural gas in the future so we're not going to get hydrogen for natural gas if you're going to make hydrogen that's green, you've got to use a process called ele- electrolysis. Mm-hmm. And electrolysis, like all processes, has to obey the second law and the first law and the third law of thermodynamics. And it turns out the best possible case, if you build a perfect machine, um, you're only going to get a little more than 70% of the energy that you made with your solar cell converted into hydrogen. In, that's that's converting it into the stored the stored hydrogen. No, that's even, that's before you've even stored it. It's before you stored it. Just making gaseous hydrogen. Right. And then you got to compress it. Gaseous hydrogen is a. Everyone says hydrogen is an incredible fuel with incredible energy density, and they quote that hydrogen has an energy density of 120 megajoules per mm. kilogram, and they tell you why that is good because it's more than double that of diesel, which yeah. is 46 megajoules per kilogram. This is what's wrong with me as I remember these numbers. Um, anyway. Uh, that's not true because hydrogen that's only if the hydrogen is fully liquefied and nearly nearly a solid but it's a gas and so it's a tiny tiny one thousandth five thousandth of that Mm -hmm. as a gas so you have to compress it to compress hydrogen most of you have used a bike pump if you've done a really big tyre and you feel the pump the pump is hot Mm -hmm. that's the second law of thermodynamics in effect and you're you're wasting heat in yeah. doing that compression process. Fifteen um, percent of the energy in the hydrogen is used to compress the hydrogen from gas to okay um, compressed hydrogen. So we've got thirty percent in the. So you lost seventy, but you got to multiply it because the losses. So you got to multiply 0. 0.7 yep. times 0. 0.85, which is the eighty-five you do get. Yep. Which gets you down to like 0. 0.6. Yep. So you, and now it's stored and it's 0.6 and now we need to get it back. Then you've got to get it back and you've got to do something with it. And yeah. You've got two options. You can put it through a fuel cell, which is, has the same efficiency limit as, or nearly, as the um, as making of the hydrogen. So it's only about 70%. So you either take that 0.6 and multiply it by that 0. 0.7. 0. 0.7, which is going to give you 42. 42%. Yeah. That's only if you do everything perfectly at, and really slowly. That's the other consequence of thermodynamics. Yep. You're not going to do it perfectly or slowly, so it's probably only going to be 35 or 30. Right. 
then there's the even worse way to do it, which is you use hydrogen like we use diesel or natural gas and you burn it, and then you're only gonna get 40 or 50 or 60% out. Yeah, of right. So it's 0.4 times 0.7, which is 0.28, but you won't be perfect, so you'll be 0.25. So, so, it's, so it's just just important to point out that there that with there's, there's there's two there's two different options with with hydrogen. There's the compressing it and then using it uh, to to use a, a fuel cell, and then there's the burning the burning of it, right? And and what you're basically saying is that either way you do it, you're you're again at a um, the, the the incredibly inefficient compared to to battery electric. Incredibly inefficient and doesn't matter what you're doing whether you're trying to sell this idea to heat homes or to run cars or to do it you're going to lose at least half and maybe two-thirds of the renewable electricity that you started with which ultimately like practically means you got to build twice as many solar cells you got to build twice as much wind turbines so before you even build the machine that's going to run on hydrogen you've going to inherently have spent two or three times more money on making the electricity. Yeah, yeah. Then you've got to build the tank, you've got to build the compressor, you've got to build the fuel cell. All of those machines have a whole bunch more complexity and cost than yeah. just an electric motor. Yeah. And so, which you will also need at yeah. the end of that. <laughs> you need it anyway. <laughs> uh, and so, like, you, you honestly, it's the world's worst. Rube Goldberg machine is one of those things that fascinates you with a kid, which is a machine that's way too complicated to, like, you know, is how you use your toaster to dry your pants or something. Yeah. Like, that's the... Well, hydrogen is dumb like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, but we will use a little bit. We'll, you know, we need hydrogen to make fertilizer, so that's ammonia. Nearly 1% of the world's energy is used to make ammonia. Yeah. We might use it to make steel, although if you're betting on... If you're a betting man or a betting woman, you'd probably bet on electrochemical pathways to steel. Yep. Yeah. Um, even if you make all the world steel with hydrogen, you're going to use a fraction of 1% of the world's energy for that hydrogen. Yep. Um, you can go to a couple of other places where we might use it for industrial heat. Like, in the bullish case, when you, you, you like, maybe it gets to 5%. Yeah, yeah. But but really, and that's, uh, you know, look, on, on, on storage, using... So, and, and again, it's important probably to, to point out to people that... Um, Hydrogen can be used as a store. It's it's used as a storer of energy, almost com comparative to a to a battery. Um, but would you say that um, less than one percent of the world's energy storage will be in hydrogen, and ninety nine percent will be in batteries? Is that is that a fairish kind of statement? Uh, you may end up being right. I think about it this way. I'm not going to name the number. Yeah. But. Um, people worry about for example well how do you get through winter so in in Victoria you get about half as much solar energy in winter as you do in summer mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so someone will say well let's build a, enough solar to power ourselves through summer but then you've only got half as much energy as you need in the winter mm -hmm. turns out if you mix solar and wind wind is stronger typically in the winter in Australia solar is typically stronger in the summer they balance each other out over the course of the year as yep. long as you're pulling from a whole bunch of different sources that's why you need a national transmission grid because yep. you average them all out more um, so you might need 25% you'd be 25% short in winter if you designed your system for summer right right but think about it why not just build 25% more because if, if I go through hydrogen, I've got to build 200% more. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. And, you, and you mentioned that in the book, actually. Yeah. Why not go for, well, really, we should be going for hundreds of percent, but 125% build out of solar or wind or whatever um, is more um, effective than even building the batteries. Is that, it, is that right? You, you, as a lot of, some of the batteries you, we think we need, we won't need because we'll just have more supply than we need because yeah. it'll be cheaper than some amount of batteries. And this is my argument for you for hydrogen, right? So we'll build an oversupply of some amount, but then at some point using some of that oversupply to create some hydrogen will be economically viable yeah. for some industries. And I can't tell you whether that's one, two, three, or four percent. I can tell you it's not twenty and it's not fifty. Yeah, yeah. What's stopping hydrogen is is, is it a couple a couple things really. 
it's, it's running into the laws of physics is the first one. But the other one is that um, logistically it's, it's kind of a nightmare. Like the supply chain for hydrogen, um, let's compare it to, to batteries. If you've got a garage, you've got a, a fuel station in your garage and you can send, so with, with electricity, you can send electrons down the wire and anyone with a garage essentially has a fuel station in their garage. With hydrogen, I guess it's like, well, like fuel, you know, right? You need to truck it around and pipe it and the argument, there's always infrastructure. The argument for hydrogen is driven by the natural gas industry. A little bit because they sell hydrogen yeah, as right. the byproduct. Yeah. Also because it's familiar and they want to convince you that everything the natural gas does today, you're going to do with hydrogen in the future. Mm -hmm. It's really disingenuous. You have to compress hydrogen twice as much in terms of pressure, which makes the tanks more expensive and a whole bunch of things. Um, you can't pump hydrogen through the existing natural gas network at, at about 10 or 20 percent. The hydrogen starts to embrittle the steel and you get things that look like the Titanic happening, yeah. which was a hydrogen embrittlement problem, yeah. having to hit an iceberg. Anyway, you don't want to put hydrogen in our, in our natural gas pipes, so that's not going to happen. So you've got to build new infrastructure for it if you want to do it for that model. So that's that idea is terrible. That's mm -hmm. not going to happen. And then there's the problem that hydrogen is, you know, and it, it burns invisibly. It's when you ha when you store it, it's at such high pressures that the thing that kills you isn't the fact that you would suffocate if you tried to breathe it. It's not the fact that you'll burn to death when it's invisibly burning around you. It's the fact that when it ruptures the tank and releases so much energy stored in the tank that it'll collapse your lungs. Yeah. So the third way hydrogen kills you in a car accident is by burning you to death. I saw a YouTube of yours where you explained the three ways you die from hydrogen. So is there, what, what are they again? The first way? The first way you die is from the compression wave from the explosion of the storage tank collapsing your lungs. Mm -hmm. Then after that you suffocate in this all of the vacuum hydrogen, of, uh, yeah, vacuum of oxygen because yeah. there's all hydrogen around you. And then once the hydrogen is mixed with the oxygen sufficiently, you're on fire, but it's invisible. Right. So on top of the running into the laws of thermodynamics, there's that as well. So it's a pretty hard sell. Yeah. Um, as a vehicle thing, it's not going to go in your homes. And so then you've got to start getting to these industrial uses of which there just aren't that many. Yeah. Um, so then people say well maybe we'll turn all the hydrogen into ammonia but then you're going to all this effort to make the hydrogen molecule then you lose more energy converting the hydrogen molecule into ammonia yep. and then ammonia turns out to be the explosive thing that we use to make not only fertilizers but bombs mm -hmm. so it's like a, not a lot of great ideas yeah now it um it's also been talked about that you could use hydrogen to produce steel but you're actually saying that that there are now technologies where you you don't even need hydrogen to make steel. You, it, um, is that right? Is it Tyson Krupp? Uh, no, so I might know a little bit about this because I used to work in a steel mill and I did metallurgy and studied how you make steel. Mm -hmm. And so the reason you have coal in steel and we use the Bessemer process for it in the blast furnace is because you need a reducing agent to eliminate the oxides in the iron ore mm -hmm. and a few other things, a few other things. Um, people consider using hydrogen for a reducing agent but at the end of the day why is hydrogen a reducing agent it's because it's got free electrons so why don't you just use oh wait a second electrons yeah right um which means you can just it's pretty extreme electrochemistry so electrochemistry means it's chemistry with electricity running through it yeah um but you turns out you can now create iron and steel from using electrochemistry actually a professor of mine from MIT Don Sadaway and his group have um, pioneered that technology and um, that's a company called Boston Metals BHP is actually an investor uh, Breakthrough Energy Bill Gates and all of his mates are investors it's not a slam dunk winner but it's um, it might you know it's at least as good a bet probably a better bet than hydrogen yeah. for steel now this is where now you've, you've got a, you've got a chapter on basically on exports and on how um, the, the 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 language or the, the narrative over the last few years is that we're going to export energy. But in the book, what you say is rather than exporting 
energy itself, we use that energy here to add value and export higher value. At, we add value to products. So instead of sending, instead of shipping all this iron ore, we use our enormous amount of renewable energy to turn that iron ore into steel and we value add. And by value adding, we can turn $70 billion a year of iron ore into $700 billion worth of steel or something like that. Is it roughly? That's a good summary of the argument. But before we even talk about what we can do in the future, can we talk about the lies we tell ourselves in the present? Absolutely. So one of the big reasons we are the governments and the, the fear mongers in the Australian economy who say we shouldn't fix climate change are worried that we're going to lose our fossil fuel industry mm -hmm. as though our fossil fuel industry is an amazing industry for Australia. Um, it, it isn't. Like, they only look at one side. Mm -hmm. Yes, we export a shit ton of coal and it makes us money and we export an enormous amount of natural gas as um, LNG. Yep. Um, I think we make... 50 60 billion dollars a year on coal we make 10 or 20 billion dollars a year on lng it's about 80 billion dollars a year in income to australia mm -hmm. but remember we don't earn all of that because you've got to use energy a bunch of diesel to run the mining trucks and a bunch of diesel to run the trains to get the coal from where it's mined onto some boats and a bunch of diesel to run the boats or bunker fuel like so the profits only a fraction of that profits a fraction of that let's you know a, an amazingly profitable business in the modern world is 40 percent margins mm -hmm. this industry is not that amazingly profitable um so let's be really generous and say it's got 25 percent margins the australian fossil fuel industry that means we make $20 billion in profit on our $80 billion in exports. $20 billion sounds like a lot of money. I would love to have $20 billion. Mm -hmm. The second thing I would do $20 billion might be buy one of these cars. Yeah. <laughs> um, but guess what Australia does? Speaking of cars, is we spend more than $30 billion a year buying... Um, petro petrol. Petro no, yeah, petrol. buying oil. Yeah. That, and most of it now is processed overseas, so we don't even make the money for processing ourselves. We buy it as petrol or diesel, pre-made. And so Australia loses money on fossil fuels. Wow. So It is so a let, fucking terrible idea. Let me just recap that <laughs> so I've got it right. So you, you take all the, all the revenue from our fossil fuel exports, you then take out all the costs and you're left with the, the, the profits of our exports. Yep. And it's actually less than the amount we pay to import uh, oil and petrol for our cars. Right. But the a disingenuous economist will accurately pull me up a little bit, but say, well, you are spending a bunch of that 60 billion that we don't make as profits paying miners and doing paying for operations yeah. and etc. And that is true. So it does create some jobs with that money that we're spending. But even that, you know, to be disingenuous to the disingenuous economists argument all of our coal companies and LNG companies like roughly 80% are foreign owned yeah so we're not even keeping that money here I heard 70% of profits go offshore in the Australian yeah. resource industry yeah and yeah. when you compare that to the unbelievable number of jobs that we're going to have mining lithium mining copper mining uranium mining aluminum and iron ore which will continue because the world turns out that windmills are made out of wait for it steel and aluminum what's yeah. australia good at steel, steel and aluminum, aluminum. <laughs> um what's australia also good at copper what do you need for the giant magnet thing on the top of the wind turbine i know i know this one thing? i know this one copper, copper. yeah we're going to do really well and we're going to be smelting it locally because wait a second we'll have the cheapest fucking solar and cheapest wind in the world yeah. because we have the most of it and we've got this giant country with not a lot of people and a huge amount of wind and solar so we win that and game and it will create so many more jobs yeah and then you know to come back to disingenuous people we have the politicians who are trying to tell you well they're going to take those coal jobs away tomorrow and they said we we've allowed the the narrative of the oppressor yeah to oppress us absolutely and um something another thing i've really been trying to talk about through my socials over the last 12 months is um, the difference between centralized and decentralized energy, right? 
Oh, you fit, that's the uh, endorphin button again. Sorry, just got a little, <laughs> just need to reach out. <laughs> Feeling, see the smile, it's very fast. Yeah. I've got too much beard for you to really appreciate the subtleties of the smile, but underneath it, trust me, that's... We're awake again. Yeah. Um, so, centralized and decentralized energy, right? So, coal, oil, and gas are centralized versions of energy where a handful of companies own um, the supply chains and we're all kind of dependent on them. You can put nuclear in that category because whoever owns the nuclear power plants has basically like a monopoly on, on power. You can put hydrogen in that category as well because if you have the, the capital to, to build the assets that, that can produce the hydrogen, you have an advantage. Decentralized energy, re renewable energy, community-owned solar, household-owned solar, and community-owned batteries, um, community-owned wind farms are forms of decentralized energy. And what I find fascinating, or, or what I think is going to be really interesting over the next 10 years, is the relationship between energy and politics, and that uh, decentralized energy will lead to um, decentralized political power. I'm going to say it a different way. Well, first, like, we won't do 100% of the world's power with decentralized. Sure, sure. But in Australia, you could do at least 50%. Mm -hmm. um, really, how much you can do depends upon your population density. So, New York City can't go even close yep. to doing enough energy on sure. New York City. Um, but once you're in suburbs, the population density of West Sydney or Wollongong, actually you can do more than half the energy the community wow. needs on its roof. You can average around 50%, you reckon, for, for a country like Australia? Yeah, as... in, in rural communities you can do 100% because you do some community solar, some community wind projects, community battery, and you're, like, you can do it all. And I, I didn't, I, I think, I really appreciated why this is important when this year, well, actually last year, 2021, I went back to the US to clean up my American life and one of the things we did is we ran an event in Washington DC because as Rewiring America we were building political coalitions and we, we started the, the the Mayors for Electrification group which is like a now a growing group of 200 mayors that are promising to electrify the city and CEOs for electrification which is getting all the CEOs to sign up to we're going to electrify our companies and, yep. and all these things because you know, we need a lobby group that's as big as the natural gas industry's yeah. lobby group to fight back, so we're going to build that lobby group. Yeah. But the other thing we did was build, um, in the US, the first Senate caucus for electrification mm -hmm. in the US. And that was pioneered with us, with a fabulous senator there called Senator Martin Heinrich of New Mexico, and he's a real champion. He's an engineer, turns out, one of the few engineers in American Congress. He's kind of, you know, because he's an engineer, he gets that, right? He's yeah. done the thermo class that you and I took. Yeah. He gets that electrification is future everything, and he's going to bet his political career on it. He's got this electrification caucus. Long way of saying, we threw a party in D.C. with lots of cocktails, <laughs> and we invited all of the Senate caucus for electrification. Brilliant. And I'm not going to remember the name of the the, I'm like the technical guy for Rewiring America. Alex is the political guy. He's amazing. He remembers everyone's names. Mm -hmm. Um, and anyway, the second where everyone's making speeches, all the senators on the caucus have to make their own speech. Mm -hmm. And one of them stands up and it said, this is going to be the largest transfer of wealth in human history from the traditional providers of energy to the traditional consumers of energy. Wow. And it was just such a concise way of saying, oh yeah, this is gonna rearrange the economics of the world in a good way. Yeah. And it's going to put the, bring the bunny money back to your community. Mm -hmm. And we have been doing this work in the U.S. showing that the electrification package of goods for a household is going to save a household twenty five hundred dollars a year by twenty thirty. In Australia, it's even better, maybe as much as five thousand uh -huh. dollars a year for the cost of having their energy in their cars. And um, but it's even come home more importantly in the past few months we've really been thinking through well what does it mean to electrify a whole community because a few largely well-to-do individuals or households like my household we've been able to electrify everything we got electric car electric mm -hmm. stove electric heating it's all good so we're benefit benefiting the future 
but one house is not a suburb and the resistance that is still out there in the world for this vision is people say oh you'll never make it work you'll never balance the whole grid you'll never match all the phases of the electricity there'll be under voltages and over voltages ah it's too hard let's just keep fucking the planet naysayers the naysayers the okay doomers the um I think Michael Mann in his most recent book said it really well, The Inactivists. Yeah. Well, it's too hard, so let's just not fucking try. Yeah. So anyway, I don't like inaction. <laughs> um, so I'm like really thinking through. I literally walked every street in my community here recently and mapped the electricity grid so I could see where all the transmission lines, mm-hmm. where the distribution transformers were, there, the big box on the top of the tel- utility pole where the high voltage lines are, where the low voltage lines are, how it all works, because I'm thinking through what does it take to electrify a whole suburb. Yep. In going through that exercise, it turns out the structure of the grid is that, I should put the auto, no autopilot, still doing it. <laughs> um, the local transmission grids are broken up underneath a substation. Typically a substation serves about a thousand homes. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if you've got to think about like the problem you've got to solve to prove to the world that this is going to work, you've got to show that if a thousand homes under a substation are all driving electric vehicles that are as fun and hilarious as this one. Um, and <coughs> sorry, I actually bruised the back of my head. <laughs> um, but if everyone's driving these fun electric vehicles safely at the speed limit, uh, autonomously maybe, and if we all electrify all the things, how do you make that whole community work? And then it dawned on me, Oh, because I was looking at the economics. My community, um, just north of Wollongong, 1,000 homes exactly live in the, our postcode. Uh, they spend about $3.6 million a year on petrol and diesel. Wow. Um, we could power 50, you know, 25 to 50% of the community off our roofs of all of the energy. Um, and then we'd have to maybe have some wind that is there's good wind resources locally we could use some pumped hydro for storage here we could get some more solar in the community outside the community anyway if you did all that and we were 100% renewable and we were all driving electric vehicles in our community we'd be spending the equivalent of about $700,000 a year on driving the vehicles wow um, so more than was that like a quarter a quarter of the price was it three, did you say three million? It was about three point six million to about seven hundred grand. That's how much will come down in yeah, the next so by in it's the like next a fifth few or years. Something like that. A fifth, yeah. But that's but the real point is like a thousand, you know, everyone knows the suburb. You know roughly the faces. We there's one pu- public school and one private school in our community. There's six hundred and eighty kids. Three million dollars a year extra cash that's being spent wow. in our community. Yeah. That every year you can't buy new school halls fast enough. You yeah. can't build enough football fields, right? There'll be so many more cafes. There'll be so much more action in that the local amazing. economy. There'll be, you know, that means there's got to be two thousand um, tradies that have got to get a phone call say I need you to install a vehicle charger. You need another two thousand tradie phone calls saying I need an induction stove. Yeah. Another two thousand I need an electric That's hot phenomenal. water heater. It's like the community rejuvenation that could happen uh, economically around this is like kind of mind blowing. Mind blowing. Yeah. And we won't be spending we won't be spending thirty million dollars a year to put diesel Petrus. particulate into our children's lungs and and give that money to people whose politics probably don't agree with ours yeah so the great news is Ford has sort of got this commitment to making crate motors crate motor is the literally comes on a crate the idea is you blow up your motor at the Friday night drag races you order a crate motor it arrives on a crate on Wednesday you have it in the car you go out on Friday night and you blow you it up it again in. yeah right anyway there's an electric crate motor now courtesy of Ford um, comes out of the Ford Mustang uh, Mac EGT. I think it's going to be amazing for the like enthusiast community. Yeah, right. The classic, the rebuilds and yeah. stuff. Yeah. For three thousand eight hundred bucks, you can buy one of these to do two wheel drive. Yep. Um, and it comes with about two hundred and seventy horsepower. Uh, no, yeah, me, more maybe. Anyway, I'm going to put two of those in the Lincoln Continental, so awesome. I have a six hundred horsepower wow. Lincoln Continental. Uh, I think I'll put the same two in the Monaro. Some people think you should put the Tesla in. Tesla's a bit more uptight about letting you. But you can't buy a crate motor from Tesla, I take it. You can't buy it without the car wrapped around you it. You can't buy it without the car wrapped around it. Maybe you buy it out of a car that's wrapped around a telegraph pole. Yeah. So I, I am 
lurking on Gumtree looking for a, a rolled Tesla. If anyone out there would like to just donate me their plaid, I will reskin it with uh, <laughs> something more that, interesting. That would be sacrilege to, to take no, the car no. away from the plaid motor. Jeez, <laughs> that I heard. I watched Sandy Munro uh, tear down the plaid recently, and he said it, it is a symphony of engineering. Huh. What took Legacy Auto so long? And you now you and I have. You actually know about the EV1. You probably know a lot more than I do. But I've watched a documentary. I tried to own an EV1, but I wasn't allowed to buy one because they were all bought back by GM. And quick background: There's a documentary called "Who Kick, Who Killed the Electric Car." In the 90s, GM built an amazing little electric car called the EV1, yep. and they gave it to a few hundred people to, to With test. Drive it. train designed by one of the smartest people I've ever known, called Alan Kikoni. Wow. Uh, who also tries to build sailplanes that can fly for indefinitely using algorithms to find thermals. Yeah, wow. He's an amazing guy. So, so the EV1, people loved it. They, they recalled it and crushed them all and, and buried the project. Why? I don't believe the conspiracy theory. Um, they weren't ready. They didn't have enough range. Um, they were a good car. They were a good effort. I think they would have been able... They weren't selling enough at the end of the day. Right. It was still 10 years too early. Is the battery tech um, the limit? Battery technology was the limit. Um, social, you know, no vehicle charging infrastructure. Um, they were a spectacular car if you never needed to go outside your community. Yep. Um, so, you know, the electric vehicles have been a good idea for a long time, but they needed lithium batteries. They needed the laptop industry sure. to drive the cost down on lithium batteries. They needed bunch of things anyway they've arrived so um, I think let's worry less about what took everyone so long to get here focus on the future um, more pertinent to the Australian audience is not who killed the electric cars like who fucked up Australia's electric car strategy yeah right so you know here's a representative conversation I was caught I'm going on a road trip next week to sell to do the book um the vintage electric car I have here only does about 120 kilometers. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to buy a Tesla to do a road trip, so I was calling people I knew, and I called the head of Toyota Australia, and like, I've heard you've got an electric Land Cruiser now. Can I borrow it for a couple of weeks for yeah. the tour? And he said, "Well, they're only legal in the mines because they're an experimental program mm -hmm. in the mines." And um, and I said, "Well, you know, when are you actually going to have an electric car for me then?" And he's like, it's like bluntly, I don't know who's the head of Toyota, he's high up in the Toyota apparatus. I actually know the head of Toyota Research International. He's an old robot friend of mine. Bill Pratt, he kept putting in touch with this guy. Anyway, this guy's like, look, Australian government doesn't have um, emission standards because we don't have emission standards. We've deprioritized this market. So we're not going to bring electric cars here until Australia gets issued mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, what about when Ford brings out an electric Ford Ranger? He says, well, when they do that, we will respond very quickly. Yeah, wow. But it's like just as blunt as you can get it. Someone high up in the, as high as you get in the apparatus in Australia for a vehicle company says, the Australian government's policy on electric vehicles has handicapped Australia, put us at the end of the line, and is stealing money from the pocket of everyday Australians yeah. by not allowing us to enjoy the benefits of this. Absolutely. Uh, uh, absolutely. Which is, you know... I, yeah. Anyway, so it's not so much about who killed the electric car, but who's suppressing who's the, suppressing it now? Who's writing such shitty electric vehicle yeah. policy in Australia? Yeah, and that segues nicely into um, we've only got about 10, 15 minutes left, but the the second last chapter on policy, what what governments can do to accelerate this, because basically this transition is taking place. The game is now how do we accelerate the transition and. What can governments do, both state and federal governments, uh, do to accelerate the transition to electrify everything? Um, they can do a hell of a lot. So there's federal policy, which is largely trade policy, spending money. So the federal government can set goals like emission standards to, or, you know, like the Norwegian government, by 2025, you, we will only allow you to buy electric vehicles in Norway. Yep. or by 2030 in Britain only or only zero emissions vehicles so we could do that we should be doing that at the federal level mm -hmm. we should be subsidising the early market to build the capacity for the workforce the charging networks etc so that 
these goods are available to all Australians. That's what we did with solar. Solar, Australian solar is the envy of the whole world. Mm -hmm. right? American solar penetration is 2%, here it's 30. That's because here it's way cheaper than the grid because we got our policies right. In the US, they have got all sorts of policies in the way. Um, so federal government should have a very similar policy that we had for solar, we should have for electric vehicles. So mm -hmm. we should shape the market, give all the players in the market certainty. Here's where the goalposts are. Here's the timeline it's going on. Play to these, play to that target. Mm -hmm. um, we should subsidize the early market and help build the infrastructure. We should train and develop the capacity. So one of the genius things of the Australian solar policy was the certification and training program to train the tradies to install the solar and do such a good job that they eliminated a bunch of the red tape. Mm -hmm. So the inspection, the permitting, etc. Um, we should do that for vehicle charging so that it's we, we should be training our workforce of tradies now so they can all go and install the circuits for charging your, yep. your cars. We should have the same uh, uh, winding down our gas networks policies, we should be subsidizing and building the market in induction cooking and electric mm -hmm. cooking, in hot water heating. We need to recognize that we need to incentivize the grid to bring all of those things on, to use all of them for what they call demand response. Because mm -hmm. every water heater can also be a battery. You can use the daytime solar to heat up the water in your water tank and then you can use it have a hot shower the next morning. Yep. Um, we're going to need all the batteries that we can get. So not only the batteries in the vehicles, but the batteries in your water that is in effect your water heater, mm -hmm. your space heating systems, and as well as the battery on the side of your house. So federal government can do that. State governments can eliminate, can do training programs. They can eliminate regulatory friction. So building codes, zoning codes about how the you know, electrical codes optimize that for the world that's coming. Mm -hmm. Remember that we just spent a hundred years writing the laws for fossil fuels. We just need to basically rethink all of the machines that we're going to use and rewrite the rules so that we give, make the electrical machines the cheapest machines. Mm -hmm. And we can stop uh, we can stop subsidising the fossil fuel industry. Good point. <laughs> Making a level playing field would be great. Yeah. Stop subsidising the fossil fuel industry would be huge here. And then the issue that I'm most concerned about is the culture war is going to be well it's fine for those yuppies that can like you two guys who can look handsome and drive around the <laughs> tesla i mean you look handsome not me but um what about the rest of us right I, and if we don't get our policies right and we don't help you know every family afford it then we're going to drive a cultural wedge between the haves and the have-nots that, that that argument is already starting it seems to be happening out there and, no, it and and it sounds like it's being seeded like agitated by perhaps vested interests coincidence that hey um yeah absolutely this is being exploited by the natural gas industry they're going to make try to convince you and they'll use bad math bad analysis and they'll find flaky scientists to tell you that your costs are going to go up for heating if you go to electric yeah you're etc etc but it's not true like we know where the cost of batteries are going. We know where the cost of solar is going. It's been on that steady course for 20 years. It's going to keep going. Yeah. There's no way this electric future isn't going to be cheaper yeah. and healthier. It's unstoppable now. And let's just, you know, let's make it available to everyone as soon as possible. And then, you know, I think because I'm a little bit American now, by virtue of having an American wife and half American kids, spending so much time there, like, Australia can increase the whole world's ambition because the economics work in Australia are already and are getting better and better. They don't quite yet work in the US. They're even further away from working in Europe. Mm -hmm. But if we show the path, we will absolutely accelerate that transition um, globally. And that would be an unbelievably refreshing thing for Australians who are just depressed about how horrible our climate policy yeah. has been for 25 years like yeah. and you know just not even to appeal to the climate activists like you and I but like we love winning we like being first in the world we're very competitive we like winning <laughs> this is the climate change olympics and australia can get gold 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 yeah. right but it requires concerted 
federal policy, working with state policy, working with local governments to like make this happen. Yeah, and and like this is this is our great war, our generation's great war, right? And and this is something else that you and I agree on, is that we need a a war scale effort to tackle this now, and that's not something to fear. That is something to get excited about, right? Because. Um, that is like the largest boom in economic boom in American his- history was precipitated by World War II, mm-hmm. the build up of manufacturing for World War II, and then using all of that manufacturing capacity to like the 50s, the 60s, the the a great America, which is what the America make America great and people want again, mm-hmm. was that post World War II boom where America was making all the technologies that the whole world needed Apollo program, all yeah. these big. Uh, technology advances and that could be Australia right we yeah we 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 start saving ourselves money in our domestic economy driving electric cars and installing electric induction barbecues um, running it off ever bigger solar systems storing the batteries inside the house and then then it's 2030 and we start making fat bank because we're making all the copper for the world the lithium for the world yeah etc it's super exciting let's let's um, bring, bring it on to the to the urgency why you and I want to fight um, it like it's a war um, I'm going to be really blunt Australia is, is part of a set of nations that cooked the books in the IPCC process yep. to enable modelling more negative emissions in than is probably going to happen mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and so it's with the CCS bullshit CCS, BECCS, all the various S's Yep. Um, we just can't bury enough. Um, to put that in perspective, we burn 10 gigatons of oil and natural gas and coal a year. That's what mm-hmm. we pull out of the ground. The IPCC process for the two best case scenarios is we're going to be burying 10 or more gigatons a year of carbon dioxide. Yeah. Like, by the middle of the century. We're not going to build an industry as big as the entire fossil fuel industry to stuff shit back in the ground. Yeah, it's 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 insanity. It's not gonna happen. We so, need to stop burning it. <laughs> yeah, we need to stop burning it. So if you step back from that realization, like, okay, so we shouldn't count on too many negative emissions, then this is the reality. Yeah. The machines that exist in the world today take us to 1.8. What do I mean when I say that? If every car that's burning petrol or diesel a day lives out its natural life, so lives for 20 or 30 years, if every water heater lives out its natural life that's running on natural gas, if every coal power plant lives out its natural life, the emissions from the existing machines already on Earth take us to 1.8 yeah. degrees. Yeah, it's very sobering. So, if, if, even if we... This is why people argue to... And 1.8 is like goodbye coral, mm-hmm. right? Goodbye the Great Barrier Reef. A bunch of the things I loved about my childhood. Mm-hmm. And I'm... I am sweating that I'm not giving that future to my children. Um, so, uh, you know, that's why people argue to shut down more of the coal power plants sooner, because then you can bring that 1.8 down to 1.7 or 1.6. Mm-hmm. Um, but it really just means your mental model should be this. You're currently driving the last petrol car you'll ever own. Yeah. The next time your water heater packs it in, you go to Bunnings and you buy a heat pump water heater. Yeah. Next time you're, you're, you're that precious blue natural flame uh, uh, goes out on your stovetop induction stove, right? Yeah. And we we don't yet have the manufacturing capacity to do that globally. We're about 10x off, and we don't yet have the we haven't trained the tradies to install at that pace yet. Yeah. And that's what the wartime effort needs to be. As soon as possible, ramp up all these industries. As soon as possible, ramp up the installation and maintenance network um, that's really our only chance of yeah. even but you know one and a half degrees is like you know that is super heroic at this point yeah even two degrees is is, is, is like a wartime effort yeah and and we know that during before during the second world war and the lead up to the second world war the world countries around the world transformed their economies transformed their industries within a couple of years and everyone rolled up their sleeves and, and did it. So we know that humans are capable of like these big yeah, transformations. I mean, Churchill got his ass handed to him at Dunkirk, and I'm, obviously I'm translating, um, and and by Hitler, and called Roosevelt and said, you know, we're fucked. There's no way 
seeing it, and Hitler's going to come and take my navy, and then he's going to come after you, and then you'll be fucked. Mm -hmm. That was 39, and there were less than 1,000 aircraft in the US at that point, and, only, and they were mostly only training aircraft. Mm -hmm. And they had no army. In fact, the army, US Army was training using ice cream trucks as tanks and using broom handles as guns. Wow. But then by 1941, Roosevelt had convinced Congress, like, no, it's a serious look what Hitler is doing. We have to win this war. Yeah. And then they started a thing called the Arsenal of Democracy. And they they said, if anyone can make, and they called them critical munitions. So if, you, if your company can is making saucepans, but you can make bullets, we will pay you your costs plus 7% profit. Yeah, wow. If you can make... Um, battleships so the, anyway the critical munitions were bullets guns tanks airplanes ships. and liberty ships yep um they went from making a few aircraft a year in 1943 to a thousand a month starting you know in 1944 it was just unbelievable yeah so really the like the war is won through engineering the war is won through engineering it turns out engineers are we're gonna we're gonna love the conclusion of this romance novel. Engineers are great, and they're handsome. Yeah, they are. They make awesome shit. Honestly, we need what do we need? We need our engineers. We need our miners. We need our tradies. And yeah, we need our tradies. Absolutely. This is like the job to be done is not. It's not a boffin job anymore. It's like going to scale. It's yeah. um. It's 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 not a science project. This is like get to it with your screwdriver. Hopefully, it's an electric screwdriver. Yeah. What a time to be alive. <laughs> and what a time to be alive. <laughs> Saul Griffith, thanks very much for driving this electric vehicle today. It's been an amazing conversation. Electrify everything! <laughs> Congratulations on the new book. Thank you. I'm going to be um, you know, chewing everyone's ear off I didn't about want to it. call it the big switch. Oh, really? What did you want to call it? Turning Australia on. Oh, nice. <laughs> did the publisher, <laughs> did the, did the publisher uh, pull rank? Or? The publisher pulled rank. You, know, you, get, you get to choose all the words in the book, but you don't get to choose what's on the cover. <laughs> oh, well, I'm sure... They're going to sell heaps and um, all the politicians and candidates and journalists that I meet over the next few months, I am going to be, um, yeah, telling them all to, to read if it. If you are really Australian and you really care about Australia, um, we, we have the opportunity to show the world, save ourselves money, improve our communities, increase the health of our children, make the jet skis quieter. And the leaf blowers. What's and the leaf? I mean, the <laughs> suburbs will be a serene bliss. It sounds like utopia. <clears throat> Could be. 